Hey everybody, I'm going to try to make this video not a million years like all the rest of mine. I have a problem. Sorry. So I know we've kind of been through this in class, but let's talk about it. What happens to matter in ecosystems? So we're going to talk about nutrient cycles. <gasps> Yay, the world's most exciting thing. It's not. I get it. I understand it's not the world's most exciting thing, but it shows us how we are connected basically like this to the air and water and land. That's how we are intimately connected to the non-living portions of our earth. So that's important in itself. And then when we are doing things that affect the air, the water, the land, pollution, like just irrigating crops and using water, whatever, mining, um, we should understand that's going to affect these cycles and that's going to affect living things, including us. So that's why we need to care and that's why we need to kind of look at them. Um, yeah. So what's this uh, basic concept matter in the form of nutrients? So we're not talking about energy. So we're not talking about the energy to have to move us. We're talking about the physical matter, like solid liquid gas. Um, it's in the form of nutrients, cycles within and among ecosystems in the biosphere. And human activities are altering these chemical cycles. So that's kind of the big idea. Let's take a look. Um, so what nutrient cycles are, am I going to try to talk about today? Hydrologic cycle, that's the water cycle. Try to refer to it as the hydrologic cycle. That's what we're going to talk about it as. I, I might use both to kind of get you used to it, but that's what you should use, especially if you're writing and if you're answering your FRQs, if there's something about it, call it the hydrologic cycle. Carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur. And nu these nutrients might remain in a reservoir. A reservoir is kind of like a like a place where it stays for a long, long time, or like a place where it's held. So like a reservoir for water could be like a water tower, for example, if it's just going to be sitting there for a very long time. Okay, that's what they're talking about. Um, and a reservoir might be like the ocean, um, fossil fuels, um, the atmosphere, um, rocks. Okay, so we'll see that. So water goes through the biosphere, obviously. We're made of a lot of water. It was mostly water. Um, and so water quality gets renewed. So when water evaporates or transpires out of a plant, that's just pure water. It doesn't take any of the chemicals or anything like that with it. And then when it precipitates down, that sh should be pure water, um, unless there's chemicals in the air that get into the cloud, the condensed water, and rain out with it. That forms acid rain. And acid rain is formed due to air pollution. It's not because of the water cycle carrying up pollutants. How are we affecting the water cycle? Well, we're taking large amounts of fresh water at rates that are faster than they can be re replaced um, in certain areas. So yeah, it's, it's literally raining right now. But in some areas, we withdraw water from the environment faster than it can be replaced through rain and other precipitation. Um, we clear vegetation. That's going to cause excess runoff. Um, so if there's a forest and we kind of clear it off to mine, we clear it off to build a farm. Well, that's going to cause desertification. It's going to cause more runoff. Um, and then there's going to be increased flooding when we drain wetlands. Wetlands sort of, you know, stop floods from happening and can kind of take in that water. But, you know, when we drain those, you're going to have that area flooded. So let's look at the water cycle. We have evaporation, precipitation. So that's kind of going there. And condensation. Sorry, obviously. You know, right there. So you can see the blue are all going to be the natural pathways and the red area arrows. So I need a video editor. Any of you want to like do that for free? Just let me know. Um, the red arrows are the things that are affected by us. So obviously, you no know, water is going to evaporate and rain back out. It's going to run off into like wherever rivers and streams and lakes. And some of that water is going to infiltrate and percolate into an aquifer into groundwater. Um, and that's fine. Some of it's going to run off into the oceans. That's fine. Well. When we have farms and factories and cities, we're going to pump that water out of the aquifer and we're going to actually be taking water out faster than it naturally recharges. So there could be times where that natural aquifer gets very, very, very low, which means there's less water for everyone and everything. Um, we're going to run off because we've cut down forested areas and made this flat. So there's less to like hold that water in and then get it to the roots. And then we pollute the water by with our factories and even run off from farms. 
Yay. Um, one of the natural reservoirs of water are glaciers. Here's a bunch of fresh water stored here. It's going to be there for a long time. Hopefully, hopefully. And water can make these beautiful, oh my gosh. Like weathering and erosion create, can create these like beautiful rock structures like the Grand Canyon. Here's something in Antelope Canyon. Gosh, it's just amazing. Some of those like the Roadrunner and Coyote cartoons, like those places out in like the Southwest, it's actually caused by wind erosion. It'd be cool to really go there, wouldn't it? Okay, we're not going to talk about that. Uh, or water's unique properties. That's that's for another time. You could spend at least a whole class, probably two, just talking about the properties of water and then talking about how, um, like just doing a whole lab just on water because water is pretty cool. Yeah, see, water. Hydro homies. You got to be just water. And coffee, which is basically just bean water. But anyway, so the carbon cycle the real, the big driver of the carbon cycle are living things. It's driven a lot by photosynthesis and respiration. So there's a link between photosynthesis and producers and respiration that occurs in producers. So plants res respire just like animals. And then in consumers and decomposers. Um, and there's lots of carbon in the ocean because there's, it's made, it's there in the seashells and limestone. Um, and we're adding additional CO2 to our atmosphere when we clear trees through forest fires, through burning of fossil fuels, it warms the atmosphere and makes greenhouse gas. Can't forget that carbon footprint we talked about way back at the beginning when we read the Lorax. So keep that in mind as I design this rhyme to remind myself. No, I didn't. I'm not an edgy teen. I'm an, I'm an edgy adult. <laughs> Sorry. All right, let's look at the carbon cycle. Okay, again, the blue are the natural pathways. So we have photosynthesis that removes CO2 from our atmosphere, takes it into plants, takes it into the living things. Um, and then we assimilate it. We eat those plants, we're animals, and then that carbon becomes part of us and makes our body structure. Um, and then when we respire, some of that CO2 is lost back to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Or when things die, rip. Um, they can decompose and decomposers also respire, but then we can return some of that nutrients back to the soil or these dead decaying things can get compacted and become um, a fossil fuel. Um, and then we can have it, you know, enter into the oceans and stuff. It could potentially diffuse back into the atmosphere. Um, but let's look at what we're doing. All of the human um, pathways, look, all of them add CO2 to the atmosphere. None of them take CO2 out. Okay, so now we can see where the issue is. We've set the carbon cycle off balance with our activities, burning for forests. That would happen naturally. See how there's a blue line? That happens. It's not good or bad. It's a thing. But we cause larger forest fires to happen. We can get into that later if you have questions about that. Um, we cut down forests. We're driving cars that run on fossil fuels. We're removing the carbon from this reservoir and burning it and adding it to the other reservoir in our atmosphere. So all of our actions are putting CO2 in the air. Um, let's, let's look at that. This is, this is a little bit older. We can add this now. I literally looked it up the other day and it says, let me ask Google right this minute. Okay. Hopefully it won't give me anything weird. How much carbon dioxide is in our atmosphere in 2020? Okay, that didn't give me an answer. How much carbon dioxide is in our atmosphere currently? Come on, Google, don't let me down. Okay. Wow. Um, NASA tells me, and that's why I thought it's 412 parts per million. So this goes up to like 2010. Let's extend this out here. We're up here. So yeah. Um, yeah, I remember when Al Gore made his movie, gosh, when was that, like 2005 or six, where he talked about um, global climate change and the amount of CO2 in our atmosphere and stuff. Um, apparently, we haven't learned because we're like up here. Uh, uh, I guess it's like up here. It's not as bad. Yeah, but this line has still been trending steadily upward since the 1960s. That's not good. Um, let's try to break this graph down so you can understand things a little bit better. So we're looking at um, CO2 concentration in parts per million. 
I want to make sure you understand that. So that way, if I had, a, if I looked at a million air molecules, if I could shrink myself down and collect them and look at them like this, um, like that meme of that guy, you know, the one where he's just like, yeah. Anyway, so if I could look at them like that, um, if I looked at a million air molecules today, 412 of them would be carbon dioxide. And you're like, that doesn't seem like that much. Like 400 out of a million, that's like 40 out of 100,000. That's like 4 out of 10,000. That's like 1 out of every 2,500. That doesn't seem like that much. Okay. I mean, that's fair. It's less than 1% of our atmospheric gases. Okay. Um, but let's take, let's just try to put this in context. Um, if we take that 412 and put that up here, that's 60 years. In 60 years, we've added about 100 parts per million. And remember, here it's starting at like 312, let's just call it, just to, just to make it even. It's probably more like 317, but let's just say we've added about 100 parts per million CO2 into our air in 60 years. That's more than one part per million over the entire Earth added in 60 years. That is a large percentage increase in not that much time. Um, these things can change. Like the, the concentration of gases in our Earth's atmosphere can change, and they have changed over time. But they haven't changed this rapidly in 60 years. Okay, We looked at how the, we're adding all this much in the carbon cycle, and that we're kind of throwing this cycle off balance. We're really starting to see now the, the real effects of this increase in CO2. We're seeing, like, weather patterns change. We see um, ice caps that are melting. We see permafrost melting. So these are having large effects. We cannot sustain adding CO2 to our atmosphere this quickly anymore. We can't. That's why they try to make legislations that say, hey, stop. Or they try to, um, you know, make more fuel-efficient cars. The problem is things like this, like drilling oil and, and burning coal and making cars and stuff, the way that we have, make somebody money. And if they're going to make lots and lots of money, they might not want that to stop. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Okay, what about the nitrogen cycle? The nitrogen cycle is really cool because it's all based around like bacteria and different symbiotic relationships. Man, like all these cycles are so unique and cool, right? So bacteria in action. So nitrogen can get fixed by lightning. Okay, well, let's back up for a second. Nitrogen's all around us. It's what's making our sky blue. Ah, 70% of our atmosphere. When you just breathed in, you breathed in nitrogen. But guess what? You breathe it right back out. We need it. It's part of our protein. It's part of our DNA. You need nitrogen. Like, you, it's a, a essential nutrients, like part of SHNOPS, C-H-N-O-P-S, the main um, nutrients, the main atoms, elements that we need for life. Okay, so it's all around us, and we can't get it. That sucks. All right, well, how do we get it then? If it's N2 gas, it's got like a double bond. That bond is really hard to break, so when we breathe it in, Nothing in our body can break that strong bond between the two nitrogens, so it just breathes right back out with some CO2 and some oxygen too. But but that's that's we're not even gonna go there because we're getting we're in the weeds, okay? All right. So for us to be able to use nitrogen, it needs to be what we call fixed. Um. So what fixes nitrogen? Lightning, and then um some bacteria can also fix nitrogen. So what do they do? They take that nitrogen gas and they can combine it with hydrogen and they can make ammonia or ammonium. Cool, okay. Um, I don't think I want to have ammonia in my body. I think that's like kind of like nitrogenous waste. Like when you pee and it hits the water, doesn't it make ammonia? And that's why your pee smells? Yeah. So we can't use ammonia. All right. Um, hmm. What can we do then? All right, well, we need some more bacteria. More bacteria. More, I say. Okay, yeah, I feel weird. I've been in my room all day alone. So, yeah, I'm feeling weird. Um, so, 
that fixed nitrogen in the form of ammonia or ammonium needs to be changed again. It can get nitrified through the process of nitrification. So different soil microbes can change ammonia and ammonium to nitrates and also nitrites. Sometimes these soil bacteria, they'll um, have a really special relationship with their friends' plants, usually like legumes, which are like bean, bean type plants. So some of these bacteria will live in the, in the roots, in the root nodules of these plants. And you might think, ew, I wouldn't want bacteria living in me. Well, it's a symbiotic relationship. These bacteria change the ammonia and, and nitrify it into nitrates so the plants can get it into a, a form they can use. And the plant provides them sugar so they can live. So, oh, it's happy. They're happy together and they, they help each other out. So, great job. So we have soil bacteria that can change ammonia and ammonium to nitrates that plants can take up. And then once it's in plants, well, we can just eat a plant or eat an animal. And then we have that nitrogen in us. And then this is a cycle. So to get back into the air around us, um, a process called denitrification happens and nitrates get turned back into nitrogen gas. So um, how are we affecting that? Well, we add additional forms of nitrogen to our air when we burn fossil fuels. So burning fossil fuel doesn't just add CO2 to our atmosphere. It also adds different nitrogen, nitrogenous gases to our atmosphere. And this is what causes acid rain. So it's air pollution that causes acid rain. Um, and then we have additional nitrogen gas going into our atmosphere because bacteria will act on fertilizers and manure and change that into a different form. Um, so then when we destroy forests, grasslands, wetlands, we get additional runoff. It, um, we have less nitrogen in our topsoil. Um, we, we remove nitrogen from our topsoil so we can make fertilizer. And then when we add the fertilizer, those excess nitrates go into bodies of water and cause eutrophication. Um, eutrophication means when we have like a big algal bloom, like so there's a bunch of algae and the algae grow because they're like, wow, tons of nitrogen. I need that yummy nitrogen. Let me eat it up. So the algae grows out of control and dies. And then bacteria digest the algae and suck up all the oxygen from the pond and the fish die. Oops. So let's just kind of take a look at that. You can kind of see that. Um, here's our nitrogen. So electricity, bacteria can change it into a usable form. Well, ammonia and then to a usable form. Plants take it in. They get eaten, they die, bacteria turn it back to ammonia, or they poop and pee, poop and pee, that, that adds nitrogen back in. And here's what we're doing, we're adding fertilizer to our farms, that's going to cause it to run off and potentially get lost, or it could go back into ammonia, kind of be back here and be able to be used again. And then when we have a factory, um, we have nitrogen oxides, oh my gosh, the, the battle is happening right now. Okay, I escaped. Okay, don't worry about me. I survived. Whew! Also gave me a heart attack. Okay, so we have burning of fossil fuels happening and adding more nitrogen. Um, so you can see fertilizer use has gone up and up and up over time. Why? Because there's more people on Earth. We need to have more farms. We need to feed more people. So that's a thing. Um, well, let's see what that battle was about really fast. And then we'll come back. Okay, the world's back to normal. Whew. Let's talk about phosphorus and sulfur, and we'll be done with nutrient cycles. Let's, let's get this. Yay! Okay, sorry. I can't help myself. I'm weird. All right, so the phosphorus cycle is a little bit unique. It cycles through the water, crust, and living things. It's not included in our atmosphere. And so this is a slower process because it's happening with the rocks, and you know that the rock cycle itself is a slow process. There's lots of phosphorus in ocean sediments and rocks. Um, so how do we get phosphorus? You need it. It's in your DNA. It's in the phospholipids. I keep getting ahead of myself whenever I think about this. So it's in your DNA, your nucleic acids, your DNA and RNA. Um, it's, in, it's in our energy, like our energy source, ATP, adenosine triphosphate. That's what the energy, that's the battery that powers us. So we really need phosphorus. Actually, it's just a modified nucleic acid. but. Um, it's in the phospholipids that make up your cell membrane. That's like in every single cell. So even though it's not in like this insanely high quantity in our body, we really need phosphorus. This is an essential element for us. Um, it's in your teeth and bones. Um, 
So phosphate ions um, in eroded rock end up in the soil. They get absorbed by plants, they get into the food web, and then they get decomposed. This is often a limiting factor like nitrogen um, for plant growth, and, it's, and we find that in fertilizer. And then um, when you feel like asking me about the research I did, good gravy, that was a lot of years ago, um, but you can ask me. Um, that's what I looked at. I looked at how nitrogen and phosphorus can limit photosynthesis and that primary productivity in a grassland. Um, and how did I get that nitrogen and or phosphorus into them? I used fertilizer. Um, so what about our activities are affecting it? Well, we clear forests, we remove phosphate from the soils to make fertilizer, and then it's going to, our erosion is going to help leach phosphates into streams. Like if we like, like strip an area down to mine it, if we clear the forest, there's going to be additional runoff and the soil is going to run off with it and we're going to lose that and we're going to lose the phosphorus, phosphate ions. So just take a minute to take this in. Whew. I'm yeah. going to take a minute to have some water. All right, so plate tectonics is going to move rock, create rock, um, and then it's going to get weathered and eroded. So we've got this, let's just say this rock was uplifted some 20 million years ago. Well, it's going to get weathered and eroded. That's going to get dissolved into the water and then eventually get into plants through like phosphate ions in the soil and then into the, the rest of the food web. Then it can get decomposed and then kind of have a loop right here. Um, it can also get dissolved into the ocean and be part of ocean sediments and can get into deep ocean. And then um, it might not necessarily be lost, but after, oh, you know, a few hundred million years or so, that, that deep ocean can get moved and changed and pushed somewhere else and recycled because of the rock cycle. Well, and here's us. Um, so when we strip an area or deforest an area or mine stuff, we can add phosphates. It's in our sewage. It's in fertilizer. And we just are adding additional amounts into our water. Not great. Okay, so let's look at sulfur. Um, sulfur is found in organisms, ocean sediments, soil, rocks, and fossil fuels, and there's sulfur dioxide in our atmosphere. Um, volcanoes and anaerobic decomposers can release hydrogen sulfide in swamps and in tidal flats, and sulfate salts released in sea sprays, forest fires, and dust storms. And marine algae, um, they can they can become sulfuric acid when they decompose. And bacteria can convert um, types of sulfurs into metals, which later can be mined. So what about us is affecting the sulfur? And we need sulfur. That's one of the other, um, the C-H-N-O-P-S, it's the S. Um, so it's one of the main elements needed in living creatures in our um, biological molecules. So our activities can impact the sulfur cycle. How? Well, we burn sulfur-containing coal and oil, so we release sulfur into and sulfur dioxide into the air when we burn fossil fuels. Um, we refine petroleum, so when we like get petroleum out, um, like the oil out of the ground, it's not ready to just be put into your car. It has to go through a refinery. We'll talk actually later about that process of how it gets refined, how it gets changed and stuff, and you'll have a better idea, but um, through the refining process, um, like there's sulfur is released, and then um, we can convert the sulfur containing um, metallic mineral ores into something else, into something that we can use and it will, re will release sulfur. So let's just take a look at this. Um, there's sulfur in rocks and it's, it's one of the reservoirs. Same thing with the sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere. There's not a whole lot in there. Um, so this is a natural acid rain it's going to come out and there's also unnatural acid rain as you can see from this side but um acid rain is a naturally occurring phenomenon if you have like a volcanic eruption that's going to add chemicals and additional things into the air and when um it's going to when water condenses and forms a cloud and it precipitates out it's going to bring some of that um, some of those ions with it so sulfur is going to be here in the rocks and stuff. Um, it's one of the reservoirs. You know, it's going to kind of go in. And then it will be taken up by plants, get into the food chain. And then when things decay and die, then the, some of that sulfur get broken back down. Um, but we take some of that sulfur out. And this is a huge amount that gets taken out um, when we mine and when we look for coal when we're doing a smelting operation or we're refining those fossil fuels, 
we're going to mine and extract rocks and sulfur is in them and we burn it and then it adds more sulfur dioxide into the air so take a look the inputs are huge there there's one natural input a, bi a bacterial byproduct is going to add dimethyl sulfide into the air and and bring back sulfur dioxide i mean it's also going to get added by like volcanic eruptions which it's not going to happen every day um so we're altering this cycle in a really big way we're adding a lot more to our atmosphere causing additional acid rain which is you know is going to have different effects so that's the sulfur cycle that's the cycle of all the biomolecules or not biomolecules sorry it's been a long day that's all i'm going to say all the elements that we need carbon carbon cycle hydrogen and oxygen from the water cycle nitrogen cycle phosphorus and sulfur, C-H-N-O-P-S. Those are the main elements that make up living things, organic compounds, biomolecules, macromolecules. We'll kind of, I'll probably end up incorrectly using those interchangeably. Whew, oh, I should use that big picture. Thanks. Well, I'll just leave this up for a second in case you want to pause. So I'm pretty sure, yep, girl, I'm just going to, hi. Hi, good to see you. Um, I'm just going to leave that up there, like I said, but that's those are our nutrient cycles. Um, if you have questions, just ask. Um, they're complex. Do you have to sit there and memorize every single thing about them? No, but you should know how we are and what different ways we are impacting the different cycles. You should understand that the phosphorus cycle has no atmospheric component. You should understand that... Um, in some cases, we're extracting a great deal and adding a great deal to our atmosphere, like this in the carbon cycle. Um, so you, you really want more of a main idea than to just completely memorize the cycles. Would it help to memorize the cycles? I mean, sure. I mean, it would help if we could memorize everything, but our brains don't work that way. So um, what, what can you do to help yourself remember some of these things? Well, I would recommend drawing a simple diagram a flow chart of some kind and connecting it in your notes um, in a way that you understand. That would help. I think that would help me. I don't even know what I'm doing. Oh, it's my pin. You want to check out my cool pin? It's my, like, mana pin. So, okay, I've recharged my mana. Now I can use my magical powers again. Look, it's been a long day, all right? So, I don't know what you want me to say. I'm going to be silly on a long day. Um, but yeah, that's what I recommend. I recommend looking over the chapter, highlighting, writing key ideas down, and making these drawings. I know you're like, I'm not doing that. I don't have time for that. I get it. You don't know how much I understand. I mean, like, I know I'm an old lady now, but I really very clearly remember being a senior in high school. I really clearly remember being in college and how much work I had and working a job and working like 30 hours a week. No, we're not going to go into more blockbuster stories, are we? Oh, God. Um, yeah, I remember working, like, until midnight. Like, I'd work five to midnight shifts, which, at the start, let me tell you, there are some fun times, okay? So, um, but, yeah, I, I'm just trying to let you know, I remember, like, going to school all day and then working seven hours at night and being exhausted and getting up and doing it again the next day. So uh, I don't want you to think that I'm not sensitive to the amount of work that you guys have. I'm just trying to give you tips to help you remember these things that I wish people would have told me because um, nobody told me and I had to sort of figure things out myself. And I screwed up a lot. <laughs> um, so my advice to you is even if you don't read every word in the chapter, look for key words. Try to find like the main ideas and the main points. You could always, like, after we talk in class, look at some of the questions and see if you can answer them. If you can, good. And if you can't, well, look at some things. Write some things down. Um, draw a simple diagram of, of these um, in your notebook so that way you have it to look back on. Um, those are all things that I would really recommend that you do. And if you don't like my videos, my feelings aren't hurt. Well, still like and subscribe. Because, uh, you know, maybe one day in, like, 10 or 15 years, I'll end up getting sweet YouTube money. I know it's not going to happen. I know. I can dream, can't I? I mean, it's either that or win the lotto. I think I've got a better chance of getting sweet YouTube money. All right. So, back to reality. Um, if you don't like my videos, you know, I've posted on our Google Classroom videos from other teachers that are maybe more concise or more, like, to the point. 
and use them to help you. If you need additional resources, just ask. Okay, I'm not going to tell you tough, okay? But keep working. We'll get there. I made it. It only took a really long time because I was, anyway, I'm not going to go there. All right. Bye.